Tonight we're going to talk about getting ready for the harvest. Hallelujah. How many of you want to get ready for the harvest? I'll never forget years ago when Pastor Alley had a dream one night. In the dream, uh, I won't go into detail, but I'll just say this part right here. As she woke up, she heard the words, get ready, get ready, get ready. And I'm telling you, we've been getting ready and ever since. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to talk to you about something the Lord has put in my heart entitled Getting Ready for the Harvest. Now, before I go any further, I want to read part, not all of this, it's just about eight pages here, when the prophet says Mary Fran Borellos was with us uh, two or three different times, she really got into a spirit of prophecy concerning us and the church, the time we're in, the ministry that God has called us to. I want to read a portion of this to you, and I want you to listen very closely, okay, because the Bible teaches us that through the the prophecies that have gone before on us that we are to wage a good warfare. In other words, you've got to hold to those things that God has said. You've got to speak them out. You've got to pray them out. You've got, to, you've got to fight the good fight of faith and see to it because that it comes to pass. Because the devil does not want the things that God wants for you and for us to come to pass. Now I'm just going to read a, a certain portions of this. There's a lot in the room. There's a lot of future in this church on this property. There's destiny, destiny for so many, destiny for multitudes, for this is a place, this is a gate, this is the house of God, and it is a gate of your anointing. And they open the gates with their words, talking about the people, all of us, they open the gates with their words and their prayers and their participation with you. And the anointing goes out into their families, into the communities, into the places where they work and go and do. This is a gate. I'm going to move forward. This is the time to move forward. This is the time to keep your eyes on the Christ. A time to not concentrate on the left or the right. For what you see will scare you, will frighten you, and put fear in you if it can. So straight ahead. Eyes on him, the Savior. Don't draw back. Don't be afraid. Keep moving, church. Don't sit down. Don't pull aside. Keep gathering and ministering unto one another. And then to your communities, spring is the time when kings go to war. Now, I'm going to go way on another service. You've come into a place in the spirit world now, right now, After this morning, you will recognize there's a place to reverence, a place with God in the spirit realm that you will now enter into because the door has been opened unto you. You haven't had this door before, and it's double doors. 2022, it's double doors needful for this decade for you. Decade, that's 10 years. Reading, that you read a few scriptures, he said the house of God, churches are called the house of God, and what you need to recognize now, the angels are describing, is that we recognize that we are gateways. We are a gate, a gate to our families and to our friends. The house of God is. Everything pours out of the gathering of the people to enable others, to help others, to help others in our family, our community. We are the house of God. We gather together as believers, and we create the house of God. Out of us, people are ministered to. Nations are ministered to. The community are ministered to, and that will take you to the gates of the city where you will have influence. You will have influence at the gates. Your gate will open the gate to the city to you. You have need to be fruitful in the house of God because it's the gate to the community, and what you do in the community will get the attention of the political, the governmental, and the financial realm. This is the house of God, a gateway. A gateway to the city, a gateway to the region, and to nations beyond. You're attractive because you're carrying the gifts that go with the gates. The anointings in this house of God. This is the house of God. This is the anointing of God, the place of God. And you partake here. And it takes sometimes dedication to be a part of everything here. But when you come together bodily, 
the angels will move among you. Now, that's just a small portion of some of the things that were spoken by the Spirit of God to us. Now, I want to kind of sum that up a little bit. Faith Family Church is a place of destiny. Faith Family Church was destined by God before the foundation of the world. We are here for such a time as this together to do what God intended for this church to accomplish in this region and in the world. We are a gateway. You remember when Jacob slept that night and he had a dream and he saw a ladder extended from earth to heaven. The angels were ascending and descending. I believe with all my heart that we are a portal. That Faith Family Church is a portal that will experience a great visitation when the power of God hits the earth such as has never before. Now, if you read the church revivals, you will find that there were, let's just take the Sousa Street revival. Happened very last day, started right about the last day of 1899, first day of 1900. The power of God literally swept the entire earth. The people that lived at that time had never experienced anything like it. And so it has been prophesied by the prophets for many, many years that there will come a last day visitation of God to the earth that is going to by far exceed anything that the world has ever seen before. And there are churches that God has called to be on the cutting edge. Now, I believe every church could be that if they wanted to be that. But how I many you know all of them don't, 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 don't want to believe that? Because they don't even want to move into the Holy Ghost in their churches. They don't want nobody to shout, dance, and run like it was happening here Sunday morning. We want the power of God. We want the manifestations of the Spirit. Amen? We're not afraid of speaking in tongues and prophesying. Amen? Now, I'm having said all of that, I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to share with you tonight. Do you want to be a part? Do you want Faith Family Church to be a part of the greatest move the world has ever seen. Turn with me to Matthew 16 and look at verse 18. The Lord Jesus, now I'm going to have to cut through the chase a lot here. You can go back and read the whole context if you want to later. But Jesus was talking to his disciples and asking who do people say that I am. Well, some say you're Elijah or one of the other prophets. Who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, notice the words that Jesus said, I will build my church. How many of you know that he did not say, I will build it all by myself? He said, I will build my church. But he did not say that he was not going to need help. He didn't say that at all. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. Paul wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. The Passion Translation says we are co-workers with God, and you are God's cultivated garden, the house he is building. The house, the church that he is building. We're laborers together with him. Amen? The word labor, if you look it up in the Greek, it means a toiler, a teacher, a worker, somebody that labors, right? Amen. Somebody that's willing to work. Hallelujah. It takes a lot more people to reap a harvest than it does to plant the field. I grew up around farming community, involved with it a lot myself as a boy. And I'm telling you right now, it takes a lot more people to reap the harvest than it does to sow the seed. Okay. And not long ago, as a matter of fact, I was looking back through some records and stuff. Not long ago, we had 112 people one Sunday, and we had 152 the next Sunday. That's an increase of 26% from Sunday to Sunday. And guess what? We were not ready. The family of five walked in. Thank God. It was a family of, of, of the regulars here. 
So they weren't offended. They didn't get mad and leave. They walked around to the back. They looked around, couldn't find five seats. No one moved. Nobody was ready to help them. So they went and sat in the back. How many of you know that the Lord will send people to a place that is prepared for them? We got to get ready for the harvest. Amen. Amen? I said, we got to get ready for the harvest. Now, I said they weren't first-time guests. What if they had been? Would they have been offended? Would they have just said, you know what? There's nowhere to sit, and there's nobody willing to help me, so we'll just leave, and probably wouldn't come back. Amen? Amen. Listen to me carefully now, okay? We must understand the value of first impression. And here's the thing about first impression. You only get one shot at it. The first time a guest comes here, we get one shot at, at making a good impression on them. That we are a friendly church. That we are a loving church. That we are a church that loves this community and loves people. And we're here to serve. We're here for them, to help them to find a relationship with Jesus. Or to develop a, a closer walk with God. The most important times for people when they visit, when they or a guest, the first time, the most important time is the first five minutes and the last five minutes. The first five minutes from the time they drive up out there to the last five minutes after the service is over. You know why? Because that is the time, if there's going to be connections made, that's when it's going to be made. The first five minutes, the last five minutes. We'll talk more about that later at a later date, but not right now. What I'm saying to you is this. You know, because those first five minutes and those last five minutes determine whether more than likely if the people are going to come back or not. So we got to prepare better in order to continue growing and, and reaping the harvest. Amen? Amen? That means that we need more laborers. We need more helpers. Now, I don't know, uh, I, I realize a lot of you are not basketball fans like I am, so I won't. Uh, I'll give you a little detail. John Wooden was one of the greatest basketball coaches ever, ever known. In the history of basketball, he was one of the best and greatest coaches of all time. He coached the UCLA Bruins for many years. He won 10 national championships. As a matter of fact, he won seven in a row. Seven years in a row, he won the national championship. One time, Sports Illustrated had him uh, a picture on, on the cover of the magazine with a caption that said, the guy who puts the ball through the hoop has 10 hands. Look at your hand. How many fingers you got? Ten. But how many hands you got? Three. Now, on a basketball team, how many is on the court, on the team? Five? So how many hands does that make? Ten. That's 10 hands, right? That means you got five people that are playing, not one. Right? See, he said, you gotta, you got to have teamwork. The key to his success was dedication to teamwork. Nobody likes a ball hop. I played some basketball. Now, not like David, not like Milton. I played some. And the one, one thing that everybody despised was a ball hog. Right? I mean, you gotta, you got to spread it around a little bit. Well, here's the thing. A lot of times in church, people don't have no choice but to be a hog with whatever they're doing because they can't get nobody else to help them. And then they get tired. Look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. Because of time, now I'm going to jump around quickly. 1 Corinthians 12, 14, he said, The body is not one member but many. He's talking about the team. The body of Christ is one, but has a whole lot of members, just like a basketball team. It's one team, but it's got a, a lot of team members, right? Listen to Romans 12, 4. We have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Every member of this body here, there's a whole bunch of members, right? I mean, you've got elbows and fingers and toes and eyelids and all kind of stuff. It's one body, but a whole lot of members and they have different functions. 
as you look around the church tonight, as you look around the church Sunday morning, I want you to notice how many members we have, and every single member has a function. Amen. Okay? Yep. We have many members in one body. All members have not the same office, just like on a basketball team. One could shoot better, while another can rebound more. Another one's a better defensive player, while somebody else is a better passer. Yet they're one team, right? And at the end of the game, now let's be carefully, every member either celebrates the win together or suffers the loss together. Faith Family Church, listen, we're one. Why do you think the Bible talks about unity so much in the body of Christ, in the local body? We're to strive for unity. We're to strive for oneness. But while we're doing that, we have to honor the various members of the body. Now, every member, every single member is either an asset or a liability to the team. Every member of Faith Family Church is either an asset or a liability. If you talk to pastors, you would discover a truth. The people that you help the most are the people who give the least and do the least. And the people that you hardly ever, ever have to help in any kind of way are the people that do the most and give the most. Everybody's either an asset or a liability. Now, a team learns real quickly if they're going to maintain a, a winning program that they have to work together, right? That's the reason that the UCLA coach was so successful. He taught them you've got to work together. One year, he had a guy. It was one of the years that they did not win uh, a championship. Matter of fact, one of the worst seasons they had, they had a guy who was an awesome shooter. I mean, he was one of the highest scorers in college basketball that year. But when the season was over, they didn't have a winning season, a very good season, that is, like they normally do. He took the young man aside, and he asked him, how many points did you make? And he told him. Then he began to ask, how many assists did you have? How many steals did you have? And what he was trying to get the guy to see was this. Yeah, you scored a lot of points, but we still didn't – achieve what we were wanting to achieve. Why? Because you didn't share. You didn't move the ball around. You didn't work together with your teammates the way you were supposed to be working together. You wasn't helping the way you should have been helping. Now, listen, a team has to stop complaining and they have to stop competing against each other. How many know there's no place for complaining and there's no place for competing against one another in a team or, or church, right? Amen. What does working together mean? It literally means to share the load. Working together means to share the load. Now listen to this real quickly. Years ago, scientists discovered why geese fly in a V, in a v formation. Have you ever seen geese fly in that V formation? Scientists studied them and said, here's the reason. When one flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the bird just behind it. The V adds at least 71% greater flying range than if each one flew alone. When one gets out of formation, it feels the drag and resistance and quickly gets back into formation. If the lead goose gets tired, it rotates back and another one takes the point. Now notice, it doesn't quit. It just simply takes a lesser strenuous position to get some rest. But it doesn't stop, doesn't quit. I don't know how many times I've had people to tell me or tell one of our department heads, well, I've been doing this for so long, you know, I, I'm just going to stop doing it. But you don't have to stop. Maybe you just need to take a less strenuous position, right? Sometimes department heads, I don't want department heads ever to feel like you can't come and tell me that, you know, I don't want to be a department head anymore. 
You may say, hey, I just want to, you know, be one of the ushers or one of the park attendants or one of this or one of that. Well, hey, listen, that's okay. But now listen, listen to the rest of this. The reason that the geese honk, the ones in the back are honking to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. And when one gets sick or wounded and falls to the ground, two more go with it and stay there until it's well or dead. That's teamwork right there. Listen to the NET version of Romans 15, verses 1 and 2. Romans 15, 1 and 2. But we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not just please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Did you get that? Not just to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Working together toward a common goal, folks, it multiplies our strength and our growth potential. We can accomplish a lot more, win a lot more people to the Lord, grow a lot bigger by working together. Amen? Amen. By way of illustration, true story, at a fair many years ago, there was a horse pulling contest. And the goal was to see which horse could pull the most weight. The horse that won pulled 4,500 pounds. The runner-up pulled 4,400. How much is that? 8,900 pounds, right? One pulled 45, one pulled 4,400. Well, then they put the two together, they yoked them together as a team, and they pulled 12,000 pounds. Isn't that amazing? That is approximately 35% more weight by pulling together. You know, uh, John Stockton, and when I was younger, John Stockton was one of my favorite players. He played for the Utah Jazz for 19 seasons. He was a point guard. He broke the NBA record, still holds it today. Listen to this. He had not the points. He only had 19,711 points. Listen how many assists he had. 15,806. Now, for those of you that don't know what an assist is, that means if I throw you the ball and you score, I get the assist. You get the points, I get the assist. I helped you to score. He was one of the best passers and also broke the record for the most steals as well. He was a very unselfish player. Now, his team, every year, 19 years that he played, made it to the playoffs every single year. And, of course, he was voted to the Hall of Fame as well. Now, one of the things that I read about him, that he was a great passer. And that's what I loved about watching him play. I mean, you're talking about a no-look pass. He'd find the man that was wide open, the man under the goal. He'd look this way and throw that way. Sometimes you've got to be willing to give it up. Do you hear what I said? You know, I remember one time years ago when I was teaching in leadership, and I said the leaders of today are not necessarily the leaders of tomorrow. You know why? Because God may bring someone in that's more equipped and better at what you're doing. How I many it takes humility to admit uh, they're better at this than they probably do a better job at it than I can. So I'll just turn it over to them and I'll help them. That takes a lot of humility. And most people aren't willing to do that. But I'm telling y'all, God is talking to us about going forward in the time that we're living in, preparing for the harvest. We've got to get everybody in their place. We've got to help everybody to find the best place for them where they function the best. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12 Verse 28, the Bible tells us God sent some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, then teachers, miracles, gifts of healing. Now look, hardly ever do you hear anybody talk about helps. Well, I want to be an apostle. I want to be a prophet. Well, how many times you heard anybody say, I, I want to be in helps ministry? And he goes on and, and he says, are all apostles? Everybody knows the answer to that, No. All prophets, everybody knows the answer to that. No, he doesn't ask, are all called to the ministry of helps. You know why? 
because it's assumed that you know that everybody's called to the ministry of helps. Look at your neighbor and say it out loud. I am called to be a blessing, to be blessed, and to the ministry of helps. Now, I'm telling you, it's a ministry. Helps is a ministry. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you this, I want you to really grasp this. That word helps in the, in the Greek, it means relief, to lay hold of, a helper, a reliever. You know, in a baseball game, we're talking about a lot of sports analogies now, don't we? How many of you know there's a relief pitcher? Huh? I mean, the guy's been out there, he's been done pitching, you know, seven, eight, eight and a half innings. He's getting tired. How many of you know he, he needs some relief? So they, 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 they bring in the relief pitcher. And there's people in our church that need some relief. They need a relief usher, a relief teacher, a relief nurse, nursery worker. But I don't feel led. I just don't feel led, Pastor. I think next Wednesday night we'll just bring a box of pencils and give everybody a pencil and let them feel the lead. Okay? You know what? I don't ever feel led to go to the dentist. I hate going to the dentist. Just to get my teeth clean, I literally hate going to the dentist. I don't like people just, ugh, it just aggravates the daylights out of me. Recently, a matter of fact, I don't know if she was new or what it was, she literally soaked me. I mean, I just soak and wet all over that thing, you know, they put in your mouth. Supposed to be sucking all that stuff out. She just soaked me all over, just sprayed me. I go, I don't feel led to go, but it's needful. It's, <laughs> it is needful. And I want y'all, every one of you, to see the need and the importance of every person helping. And I also want you to know the rewards of serving. Look at Mark 10, verse 45. Mark 10, 45. Jesus made this statement, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, in Matthew 10, 24, he said, The disciple is not above his master. Think about that for a moment. He said, I didn't come to be served. Jesus, the Son of God, our Savior, said, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. And he said, and the disciple, that's us, we're not above our master. In other words, if I serve, then you should be willing to serve. If I'm willing to give my life for others, then you should be willing to give your life for others as well. But a lot of people think that serving is below them. Changing a baby's diaper is below them. I'll have y'all to know I changed a lot of baby's diapers. Come on now. And I never felt led, not one time. <laughs> but how many know it was needful? Come on now. How many know it was needful? Now, I could have just laid there in the middle of the night and said, Honey, you go do it. Y'all yeah, know how it is. It's your turn. <laughs> no, I did it last. Your turn. But we shared. And we helped one another. Amen? Luke 14, verse 11. Jesus said, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So never think that serving is beneath you. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, the purpose, I want y'all to see this. Exodus, I, I really don't have the time to read it all, but we'll find in Exodus 18, verses 13 to 26, that God gave Moses a plan. Go back and read it for yourself. Exodus 18, 13 through 26. God gave Moses a plan of how he could take care of the needs of the people. He was trying to do it himself, but he was wearing himself out. And so his father, his father-in-law Jephro suggested, why don't you appoint people over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, over ten? And that was all according to their abilities. All right? He said, you're going to wear yourself out. He, he followed his advice. He did exactly what Jethro told him to do. And he said, now the weightier matters, you bring them to me. 
And I thank God that the Faith Family Church operates so smoothly because we've taught this through the years. Through our department heads, they understand. They can, they can, Brother Rouse over the mighty men, they, they know. They can talk to people, pray with people, reach out to people. If there's things going on that I need to know about, they'll tell Ralph. Ralph will tell me. Okay? But here's what I want y'all to see. Look with me in Exodus 17, verse 8. We'll read down through 13. Exodus 17, beginning with verse 8. The Bible says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and with them. Just keep going. Moses said to Joshua, you know, go out and fight with them tomorrow. I'm going to stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Joshua did what he was told to do. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. As long as Moses held his hand up, now y'all with me? Israel was winning the battle. When he let down his hand because he got tired, Amalek would begin to win. Moses' hands were heavy. So they took a stone, they put it under him, he sat on it. Aaron and her held up his hands, one on one side, other on the other side. His hands were steady. The Hebrew word is faithful. His hands were steady. They remained faithful till the going down of the sun. Joshua won the battle. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? They held up his hand, and his hands were steady. They, in other words, these two men helped Moses to remain faithful to the call of God. You realize, I cannot do, if anybody, has anybody, I, I can't believe not one person has come to me and said, Pastor, why isn't anybody parking cars anymore? Nobody's even asked me. Has anybody wondered why we don't have people out there parking cars anymore? Huh? Did I tell them? Oh, well, no wonder you didn't ask me then. But then, here's the thing. So I you know, I took some suggestions. Well, maybe if we, uh, you know, stop doing that, maybe some of the people are doing that will start helping the other areas. But now, guess what I'm hearing from the department heads? We still don't have enough help. Still don't have enough help. You know, I mentioned earlier what happened when those five people walked in and nobody helped find them a place to sit. And I'm not being critical. Maybe we didn't have enough people. Because on Sunday morning, you need definitely four people in here. Ushering, two here and two back there. Working together with sign language. Okay? Two, five, working together. Will you move over? I noticed a while ago when I walked in, Josh has got a sign up there. What does it say? Squeeze in something. Move over. I don't even know what it says. But it's encouraging people. Make room. Okay? Make room for others. Now, even in the days of the early church, the disciples, they must have learned some, some of the, from some of these lessons in the Old Testament because if you remember in Acts chapter 6, they, were, they appointed seven men that were full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, right? They were to take care of the menial work. The disciples said, it's not right for us to leave prayer in the Word of God and to, to serve tables. It wasn't that they felt that serving tables were beneath them, but they had their priority right. They had to put prayer and the Word first and foremost. So he said, appoint seven men full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost to take care of these other things that need to be done in the church. And that's exactly what they did, and it worked well. Amen? Now, out of those seven men, Philip and Stephen are mentioned again, but five of them are never mentioned again. You see, everybody wants the anointing of Elijah, but nobody wants to serve like Elisha. You say, what are you talking about? Look at 1 Kings 19, verse 21. 1 Kings 19, verse 21. Now, Elisha eventually got the anointing and actually did twice the miracles, at least so they recorded, than Elijah did. But that's not how he started out, folks, okay? Promotion begins at the house of God. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south, the Bible says. Promotion comes from God. 
Now, I know people say, well, I, I, want, I want to experience promotion, and I'm tithing, and I'm giving. That's good. But how many of you know that there's a place in the body, the local body for each and every person, and God will promote you if you will find your place and be faithful at it, no matter what it is. The Bible says, Elijah returned back, took a yoke of oxen, slew them, boiled the flesh with the instruments, gave to the people. They ate. He arose, went after Elijah. Now watch this. Elisha went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Everybody say, Elisha ministered to Elijah. Now what does that mean? It means he served him, the Amplified Bible says. He served him. How did he do it? Pull up 2 Kings 3.11. 2 Kings 3.11. When these kings are asking, is there a prophet? Now, Elijah's gone. He's going to be with the Lord. Elisha's now a prophet in his stead. Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire of? One of the king's uh, servants said, here's Elisha, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. Which poured water on the hands. That's how he was known. He, was, he described to the king Elisha as the man that used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. The NET says Elisha is here. He used to be Elijah's servant. He used to be Elijah's servant. Yeah. Amen? God wants every one of us to have a servant's heart. Be willing to serve. If most spirit-filled Christians were as willing to serve and wanted to serve as much as they want to prophesy to everybody, the house of God, the church, the local body would be a lot more healthier. I had a, I had a pastor call me. Y'all wouldn't believe the pastors that called me asking me for advice and how to deal with things. I had a pastor call me not long ago, and he said, Pastor, he said, I got a man in my church. He doesn't do anything. He's not faithful. He doesn't uh, to tithe, and uh, he doesn't serve in any capacity. He said, it seems like almost after every service, he goes outside as people are coming out, and he prophesies, starts prophesying to people. I said, put a stop to it. Put a stop to it. Tell him he can't do it. Tell him don't do it anymore. If that man wanted to serve God and help the church as much as he wanted to prophesy, he could be a lot more of a blessing. Amen? Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible says to covet the prophesy, and all may prophesy. But that's just like those people that came in here years ago when we first started and got going for the first couple of years. Oh, you're talking about demons testing me. They'd stand up right in the middle of me preaching and start trying to prophesy, and I'd have to make them stop. Yeah, all kind of crazy things that would happen. And we'd have to say, you can't do that here. We had an old family came in one night during a revival, filled up a whole row across here. And all of us came in late. Number one came in late. Number four from Sunday, in case you weren't here. Johnny come lately. Came in late, filled up a row. All of a sudden, I saw them all reaching down. I'm like, what in the world are they doing? About to pull some snakes out of something? No, it was tambourines. Every one of them had a tambourine. He said, what's wrong with a tambourine? In here, it's wrong. If you're appointed to put up there, it's fine. But I don't care. Somebody asked me, well, what was wrong with it, Pastor? I said, well, what if they'd have backed a pickup truck and bought a piano and sat down? Did you think that was okay? It was out of order. It was out of order. I'm telling you, you've got to do everything, as the Old Testament verse says, according to due order. You know why Uzzah died? U-Z-Z-A is a good name for your next son. Uzzah or Uzzah, however you want to call it. Okay, you know why he died? It wasn't because he touched a cart. Well, I got some of y'all then, didn't I? It wasn't because he touched the Ark of the Covenant. It was because David as king had not ordered everything to be done according to the due order. So once he died, he went back and did research, and he found out, how God told Moses to tell the Levites and the priests that they were to handle the Ark of the Covenant. So this time, he got everybody in order, and they went and got it. 
according to the due order, according to the instructions of God, and everything went well, and they brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jer Jerusalem, and they were great rejoicing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, say it out loud. Promotion begins with God. The Lord is so good, folks. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to wind up with this. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 17. Hey, in the Passion Translation, just to save some time, 1 Corinthians 12, let's begin reading verse 17. And I want to read down through verse 26. 1 Corinthians 12, 17 through 26. Now, y'all can tell the uh, young people when they get here to come on in and have a seat. All right. Now, listen to this carefully. Think of it this way. If the whole body were just an eyeball, how could it hear sound? If the whole body were just an ear, how could it smell different fragrances? But God has carefully designed each member and placed it in the body to function as he desires. A diversity is required. For if the body consisted of one single part, there wouldn't be a body at all. So now we see that there are many differing parts and functions but one body. It would be wrong for the eye to say to the hand, I don't need you. And equally wrong if the head said to the foot, I don't need you. In fact, the weaker our parts, the more vital and essential they are. Isn't that amazing? The body parts we think are less honorable, we treat with greater respect. And the body parts that need to be covered in public, we treat them with propriety and clothe them. Some of our body parts don't require as much attention. Instead, God has mingled the body parts together, giving greater honor to the lesser members who lacked it. Let's just stop right there. Lesser members. Think about that. What do you spend more time on in front of the mirror? Your armpit or your face? Huh? He talks about honorable versus dishonorable members of the body, right? And there's people who come in, and they don't feel needed. They don't feel important. Why? They're made to feel that way often. And we ought to be helping them to discover the gifts that God has placed on the inside of them. I believe with all my heart, folks, that God has placed some gift, some anointing, some calling in the, in the life of every single person he created. Amen? Amen. I'm talking about every one of your children. I'm talking about these young men and women walking in right now. Those children out there, those babies out there, every single one of them. We've got to help them to find their place, find their gift, and to develop it. Now, before you say, before you say, yeah, but Pastor, I just don't know what I could do. I just don't feel like I'm gifted. I'm talented. I just don't have nothing to offer. I want to read something to you. Now, those that have been here a long time, they've heard this before, but I have not read it in years. But I hang on to it because every now and then I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to use this by way of illustration to prove a point. Now, this is a letter entitled, God Will Supply the Resources. And um, it was written to Jesus, son of Joseph, Woodcrafter's Carpenter Shop, Nazareth 25922. From the Jordan Management Consultants in Jerusalem, the subject was staff team evaluation. Thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests, and we have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. It is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capacity. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable <laughs> and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, sons of Zebedee, they place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. He was a tax collector, you know. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, 
definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, showed great potential. He's a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. See, we're not looking to the world to tell us who is capable of serving the Lord. We know that God has placed something in you that you can serve him with. Amen. Hallelujah.